Welcome, everybody. That's wrong? I just started. Oh, three times. Okay, three times. Oh, three times big. Welcome, 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 everybody. My name is Jackson Dickert, and welcome to the Fantasy News. You may know me from here, 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 or you may just be thinking, is he out of jail already? Yes. Yes, I am. Now to get started, I thought I would go onto Daniel's Discord server to try to build some hype and ingratiate myself to the Goblin Clan. And so when that didn't work, I broke into Daniel's house and I stole some of his clothes. Um, I just thought this might be a good way to help everybody get acclimated, you know, look a little bit more familiar and everything. Does he wash these? Anyway, doing the fantasy news is a huge honor. Thank you all for having me, let's jump right in. The first story of the day is a big one from Wheel of Time. Natasha O'Keefe will officially be playing Lanfear in the Wheel of Time Season 2. I'm really excited about this announcement. She was great in Peaky Blinders, especially, I thought. Um, and I think she'll do a really good job in this role. As most of you probably know, Lanfear's appearance is primarily characterized by her stunning beauty. Um, she's supposed to be one of the most beautiful women in the world, so this announcement has swept the door wide open for the nasty people on the internet to make comments about someone else's appearance. Um, and I just want to clear the air by saying uh, that since my girlfriend was unavailable to play uh, this role um, as the most beautiful woman in the world, they actually had to go down uh, to second place and they asked uh, Kayla if she would do the role but she was unavailable uh, for that opportunity as well so then they had to go to a measly third place for most beautiful woman in the world to, to play this role out of four billion women in the world so um, some pe people are right you know she obviously is not the most beautiful but third place out of four billion is pretty damn good in my book this announcement has every dude with Dorito encrusted fingernails all tabbing from watching the Andrew Tate trial or whatever it is they do on the internet. Uh, they go tippy tap with their grimy little fingers on their keyboards on Twitter to go uh, hate on an objectively gorgeous woman. In my opinion, this is wonderful news uh, not only for her but for the Wheel of Time community because I think she's going to do a great job. Um, you know, criticize her acting all you want if you're not a fan of her. That's totally cool. For me, I think she's great in the role, and she's gonna kick ass. Hey, babe. Yeah. Uh, come here really quick. Look at this picture of the actress from Will of Time that everybody's saying is isn't pretty. <laughs> the Witcher season three is coming out in less than a week, and you know what that means? An Old Spice collab and Fortnite skins. Son of a bitch. The next story of today, I, I don't know how Daniel does this, okay? I don't know how he, how does he look at the camera the whole time, but then he's got stuff that he needs to be reading. I'm not that. The next story of the day is about uh, First Law, which I think everybody's gonna be very excited about. Um, Best Serve Cold is an adaptation of Joe Abercrombie's novel of the same name, which was published after the main story of uh, a little ditty that we've just discussed called First Law. Um, the lead actress, Rebecca Ferguson, had this to say about how everything was going. Uh, she said, we were just talking about casting and who we want around. Yeah, I'm very, very excited. We'll see now with strikes and everything that's happening, but everything will happen in its own time. And when she was asked if the project is going to happen, she confidently asserted, yes. Ferguson plays Monza Mercado, a ruthless mercenary who embarks on a quest for revenge to kill the men who betrayed her. Um, Ferguson is a brilliant actress and uh, Deadpool director Tim Miller is slated to direct this as well and on top of it all, uh, Joe Abercrombie himself had nothing but extremely positive things to say about the screenwriter who uh, was not named in any of this but I, I assume, you know, if Joe Abercrombie has good things to say about them it, it must be somebody really, you know, it's, it's somebody who lives up to the hype that he is building. Next we have Avatar The Last Airbender news. Um, you know, I, this this one's a mixed bag for me because I, I kind of wish that uh, studios would just leave properties alone. Um, the M. Night Shyamalan version was perfect in every way and 
Uh, I just don't know why we need a remake of the live action, right? Like they got it right the first time. Why go back and mess it up? Risk messing it up. You know, it's a beloved IP. Um, they really should look into animating this. I think that could be a cool way to bring it to a broader audience, but that's just my two cents as someone who hasn't, uh, who's, who's just seen the uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Just kidding. But uh, the, the first looks that we got here um, actually, I think look uh, pretty good. Uh, it's hard to say anything for sure until we get like a real trailer. Um, like Aang's tattoo is done about as well as they could possibly do it. Um, it's a bright blue arrow on a little kid's head. So doing something a little bit more muted where you can sort of see like the skin texture and that sort of thing. Nice. It would look pretty weird if it just, cause you know, in a cartoon, it's like they just, they just color the whole thing one color and you're good to go. I think that would look pretty weird uh, translating to live action. And in the same way, I think Zuko's scar looks great. Um, you know, it's like a little bit subtle. It's not overdone. It's, it's hard to say any of this for certain. Like we haven't even seen Zuko with his helmet off, but just from these two things alone, not bad. The costumes are a little bit more of a mixed bag for me. Um, it makes sense that Aang's robes look like bright and clean and brand new. Like him coming out of the ice is definitely like a rebirth for the character. Um, and it makes sense that Zuko's armor and his uniform look brand new. It's a military uniform. Have you ever seen anybody in a military uniform? Because <laughs> it's spick and span. But it does sort of have the Wheel of Time costume thing going for it, where it looks like Katara and Sokka just came out of the South Pole Hot Topic. Um, so, I don't know. I wish, I do wish, uh, it, it takes me out of it a little bit when it's like everything looks brand new. But I guess you could always insert argument here about how waterbenders can bend the water to keep their clothes immaculately clean. Even if the show doesn't meet our insanely high expectations, uh, can we all just agree that if the children actors don't do perfect jobs that we're not going to go online and bully them? Remember the Goblin Code. Kids are friends, not jokes. Overall, with the sneak peeks we've seen from Avatar, uh, I kind of have the same attitude I had about Rings of Power, where it's like, I'm excited that we get more stuff from this IP, but until I see an actual trailer with like bending in it and that sort of thing, I think that's when we're really going to be able to tell how this is going to turn out. In other news, we've got the Folio Society. They are known for making beautiful and very expensive books. Uh, they're releasing a limited edition of Beowulf on June 27th. But the main thing I wanted to show you guys is how uh, this thing, uh, whatever this is, was clearly inspired by my dog, uh, Gilmo. So the Folio Society, I, I, I don't know if maybe you'll, you wanna call me up and we can figure out how to split the royalties but um, y'all have my number, so call any time after six. Unlike the teaser we got for Avatar, which just shows some kind of like special effects, the three body problem teaser is an actual full-blown trailer, basically. As we all know, this is Netflix, so the, the quality pendulum sort of swings uh, widely back and forth. But I always like to be optimistic until I have a reason not to be. Unfortunately uh, for me, that came about 21 seconds into the trailer itself. I don't know about you guys, but as soon as I read that, it was like, everybody stop what you're doing. And I went and Googled. I was like, which creators exactly are you talking about? Are you just talking about some guy that like, maybe, you know, I haven't, I don't know as well. Or are you talking about them? Benioff and Wives are indeed the ones working on this show, uh, which on the one hand, if you Google bad writers, these are the first names to come up, which is hilarious. Good job, Reddit. These two Goombas successfully created one of the best shows ever. They created a successful adaptation for several seasons of Game of Thrones, and I don't think anyone questions whether the show was good or not early on. Um, they left out some parts of the books which people didn't like, but they also inserted events that weren't in the books that were done really well. The worst part about seeing their names on this property is knowing that these guys have the chops uh, to do a good job, but only as long as they care about the property, as long as, only as long as they're interested, I guess. Which, if you think about it, makes them a perfect match for Netflix because uh, they'll probably cancel Three Body Problem well before these two bozos uh, get bored and decide to sabotage it to go work on Star Wars Episode 17 or whatever. Um, but we shouldn't forget what they cheated us out of and we can meme them as much as we want because they're not children. Uh, but it's very possible uh, that the stars align and Netflix and D&D manage to pull this off. But 
The trailer doesn't have any red flags that I noticed, so I am cautiously optimistic. Cover reveals. We've got uh, UK covers for The Magicians. Pretty. We got a cover reveal from Women's Prize winning best-selling author of The Power, Naomi Alderman, for her new book, The Future, that comes out on July 11th. Our next story is The Vampire. Uh, vampires for me are just one of those things where it just feels like the rabbit hole goes deeper and deeper the more you look into them. I 100% thought that Dracula was the oldest vampire. Uh, no shame in admitting that. He, he's the biggest vampire, he's the OG, the one we all know and love. Why wouldn't this movie be about Dracula? But then I find out that before Dracula, uh, Sheridan Le Fanu's had uh, Carmilla, a tale about a lesbian vampire in 1872, which feels like something that you would get executed for writing in 1872. Uh, and before that, there was Varney the vampire. I, I like to imagine him like this. Yeah, it's great. And before that, there was the vampire with a Y, which is the one that we're talking about right now, uh, which still wasn't the first because there was a vampire in a poem called, you guessed it, the vampire, uh, but that's spelled with an I, uh, in 1748 by uh, this guy whose name I refuse to attempt because of my feud with the Germans. There's no good reason you can think of why I shouldn't be allowed to wear Heelys in your airport. Anyway, we're getting the vampire, blood and ink, which I think we all know are the two scariest liquids uh, with Malcolm McDowell and Derek Jacoby. Uh, production doesn't start until later this year uh, and the director hasn't been announced yet, but this sounds cool and I'm weirdly stoked about it. Uh, pick will begin with Lord Ruthven, a mysterious and magnetic nobleman who captivates London society with his charismatic charm. Aubrey, a young Englishman, becomes infatuated with Ruthven and is drawn into a world of secrets and supernatural horror. As Aubrey uncovers the truth about Ruthven's sinister nature, he finds himself trapped in a perilous battle against the allure of the vampire's deadly powers. Sounds pretty cool if you ask me. Wonder if they sparkle. So we've been doing a lot of talking about Netflix, uh, <laughs> and we're gonna do a little bit more uh, before the day's end. We've got Rebel Moon, that uh, Zack Snyder uh, movie. We've got a release date for it. Um, the $166 million sci-fi epic is going to be a two-parter with the first part coming out this December 22nd. Just for a little bit of context, Rebel Moon started as a Star Wars movie pitch more than 10 years ago before pivoting to be its own thing. Uh, it's got molten metal swords, giant half-human arachnids, ancient technology, and honestly, so far, I'm in. Um, I'll always be excited about new, ambitious sci-fi IPs. Um, Snyder's a great storyteller, so if uh, Netflix just hides all the settings for slow-mo in Adobe uh, and throws money at him, then this could be really cool. Snyder Star Wars. I'm in. We also found out how much Embracer Group, uh, the Swedish gaming company that bought the rights to Lord of the Rings last year, how much they paid the tune of about $395 million, which dare I say sounds weirdly cheap. Uh, like the rights to make the Lord of the Rings video games. That is literally more money than my entire family tree is worth. But you best believe if I had the money, if I had $400 million to spend, I would spend $395,000 on it on the Lord of the Rings IP rights. And then I would spend the other 5 million on Magic the Gathering packs, uh, so I could open the one of one, one ring to rule them all, and then turn around and sell that for 400 million, and then suddenly, I just got the Lord of the Rings IP rights and $5 million for free. Stonks. Somebody should really pay me to help run a company. <laughs> oh yeah. And while we're talking about the Lord of the Rings, yesterday, the new audiobook edition of The Silmarillion released, which is narrated by Andy Serkis. Go listen to a sample. It's just as good as you think it's going to be. So now I have some slightly different news from what you might expect from fantasy news, but it's near and dear to my heart as someone who is from and lives in East Tennessee, which is where Dolly Parton is from. Uh, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library has just partnered up with the state of Illinois to give free books to children five and under. If you only know Dolly for her music or her theme park, uh, you should know that she's an amazing philanthropist. Her Imagination Library is a book gifting program 
uh, that launched in 1995, and it mails free, high quality books to children from birth to age five, regardless of a family's income. It's supported by her nonprofit and provides books to children in the United States, Canada, the UK, and even Australia. Um, right now, the Illinois program is in its infancy, but this new deal that they've just signed will take it across the state of Illinois. So this is awesome because in the age of where you just hand your kid an iPad, uh, literacy and falling in love with reading books is more important than ever. It's an amazing program. So if you've got kids under the age of five and you live in the United States or wherever Illinois is, you can't ever find Illinois on a map, then be sure to see if you're eligible to receive free books. Daniel. Huh? Daniel, I don't know anything about One Piece. I think you know that. Oh. Uh, can you please, can you please cover this part for me? All right, so One Piece. I think the trailer has some angles to it that do look fun. The cast is clearly all about it and very passionate about this project. And I do like some of the visuals, others, not as much. It looks like it could be a fun time, but I don't think it'll be like a critical darling. And I also have, again, just this jarring sense of like, one piece to live action <laughs> really we're trying to tackle that of all the manga i've read which is admittedly not a ton this is the one that to me seems the most difficult to do and it they're doing it whether or not it's for the better or worse i have absolutely no idea uh there are some lines in the trailer that make me go Ugh, but the performances themselves really seem like the actors are giving it their all so for me, I'm still kind of feeling like this could be a dud and Netflix for sure is not gonna be able to take this show all the way to like the end of Wano. It's going to go the way of the Dodo well before that. I have never met a serious One Piece fans who think they'll be able to get through the entire story of One Piece uh, before they have to cancel it, especially with Netflix's track record. But overall, I'm still very curious and that's where I'll say my head is currently at. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for the clothes. Uh, so the next uh, news story we've got is how to become the Dark Lord and die trying. So Orbit Books is going to be publishing a brilliant and hilarious fantasy time loop duology that is all you need is kill meets kill the farm boy, where a young woman stuck in a time loop tires of defending humanity from the Dark Lord and decides to become the Dark Lord herself. This book might have specifically been written for me because honestly, this sounds right up my alley. I've been waiting for a new fantastic fantasy book with a good dose of humor in it. So this uh, is right up my alley. I'll definitely be picking it up. And it perfectly also ties into, do you like time loops? Do you like funny books? Campfire Publishing has got you covered because we only have two books, a funny book and a time loop book. The Never Ending End of the World is a sci-fi epic written by best-selling author and retired naval officer Anne Christie. You can see we've got praise from some really talented, cool folks, including our resident goblin himself. But let's get into what the book is actually about. Station Eleven meets The Last of Us in this post-apocalyptic sci-fi epic from USA Today and Wall Street Journal best-selling author Anne Christie. Coco Wells hasn't seen another living person since she was a teenager. All of Manhattan is reliving the same few seconds, minutes, or hours on a loop, and they have been for years. Everything looks normal from a distance, but up close, it's a nightmare. Coco is a survivor. She scavenges for food, reads, and most importantly, avoids loopers. They ignore her, but only as long as she's silent. She's learned the painful lesson that a broken loop can mean death. After eight years of solitude, learning to survive, and precisely timing the loops that weave around the city, Coco wonders what lies beyond New York and what has become of the rest of the world. As she leaves home for the first time, one question haunts her above all. Am I the only one left? Speculative sci-fi, dystopian apocalypse, and scientific mystery coalesce into the never-ending end of the world, a gripping tale of survival, hope, and love from retired naval officer Anne Christie. This book has fantastic reviews on Goodreads already from the ARC readers from NetGalley and Edelweiss. 
Right now, it's available for pre-order for just 99 cents for the ebook, but only until it launches on August 8th. This is the best deal you'll ever be able to get on this ebook, and it would mean the world to us if you'd check it out. Also, the audiobook is insanely good. It's narrated by Therese Plumer and Ari Fliakos. When you go check out the Andy Circus narrated Simmerillion, just just give the sample of the never-ending end of the world a listen. The other book Campfire has published, The Quest for the Golden Plunger, was written by yours truly. It's about Boy Scouts at summer camp, so if you're in need of a hilarious action-adventure romp through the woods, this is your book. It's got everything you could ever want, from a buck with tasers on its antlers, to a battle royale paintball fight, and a mystery to solve surrounding who is defecating in the camp showers. It's a lot of fun, and perfect for teens, or for adults who have somehow retained their childlike whimsy. Anyway, check it out if you're interested, it would mean a lot to me. And by the way, the audiobook for it is also insanely good. Uh, we got Todd Haberkorn to narrate it, and uh, he's just an unbelievable talent. Thank you guys for listening to us talk about the books that we've published and are publishing. We're really passionate about them, so uh, we hope you guys enjoy them too. Are you kidding me? The one week that I get to do fantasy news and there's no Sanderson news. I'm not wrapping this thing up until something happens. Oh my god. No, but seriously, where is Illinois on this map?